Okay, well, thanks for that introduction, Lockie, and uh, thanks, Cohen. My job is now impossible. Uh, I think perhaps what I could do is just walk away and let Cohen come back and keep telling him more stories. But, uh, but unfortunately, you're stuck with me now. So I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to thank the organisers of the ball, this Conquer CF Grand Ball, for this opportunity to talk a little about the history of CF over the years um, and how it's been researched, taking steps into the unknown, some exciting breakthroughs, some disappointments, lots of heartbreak, but never losing focus on the aim to make cystic fibrosis stand for cure found. And while we have those things along the way, we recognise that the goal is, is a way off still and there's always more to know and support and that's why you're all here in this room tonight. Because without you and the dedication of the many skilled health professionals and the people that Cohen was talking about, the people who helped him through, did those, that transplant, the researchers who worked out how to do that, that transplant, uh, pe parents, like my parents, uh, his parents, other people with CF, families and supporters, we couldn't do what we're doing. And uh, I think uh, CF has certainly come a long way in the 50 plus years since I was born. It's, a, it's not an old disease. In fact, CF was really only described in 1938. And, uh, and I think that was, some, that was a time when they found these babies who were dying and they weren't quite sure what was happening. And it was unfortunately after they'd done autopsies that they worked out there were some things wrong. And while that was, uh, not, it was a great discovery for cystic fibrosis because it meant people knew that it existed, it didn't lead to great change at the time, but it certainly at least gave this insidious disease of cystic fibrosis a name and, and started us on the road to taking the first steps to finding answers. The 1940s and 50s came along and saw more that was, do was done. They started to use some antibiotics and other things. Um, <coughs> and it was in the 1950s that they worked out that people with cystic fibrosis had lots of salt in their sweat and they developed the sweat test, which actually was the gold standard for diagnosis in CF for many years to come. Now I'm gonna sort of talk a little bit about my journey along with cystic fibrosis or my family as we go. So uh, CF in 1960, well, there was a, a young couple named Marcia and George Messer. They had the happy uh, opportunity of having a young a baby, me, and that was probably the best thing that ever happened to them. <laughs> but sadly, three months later, um, I had failed to gain weight. And even though my mum, Marcia, was really proud of me, and she used to go to the child health centre and say, look at all those other ugly fat babies. My baby's so slim. The problem was, I of course wasn't, um, wasn't actually gaining weight and I was wasting away. And it took a long time, especially in 1960 when no one had really heard of cystic fibrosis in WA, to, for her to find out that, uh, or for my parents to find out that I had a thing at the time that was called fibrocystic disease of the pancreas, which is a really sexy name and rolls off the tongue. Uh, <coughs> the other really uh, interesting thing of the time and, and why we've come such a long way and hearing Cohen's inspirational speech was the difference between now and then because then my parents were told to take me home, love me and that there was nothing more that could be done for me and that unfortunately they prob I probably wouldn't live to go to school. So they took me home to Albany and, uh, and they just thought well while we've got him we'll look after him and we'll just do the best we can. Uh, never did they know that 54 years later, they didn't know what they created. But three years after that, George and Marcy and my parents had another baby, and that all seemed fine, because at the time, there was no genetic testing, there was nobody told people about what was happening with cystic fibrosis, because no one really knew. And so my, ba my, ba my brother Stephen was born, and 11 months after that, I'm not sure what they were doing, or they didn't know how it was happening, but they had another baby, and Kelvin, my, my youngest brother, Kelvin. Now I was only four years old, so I didn't really, I don't really have great memories of Kelvin, except I know that uh, my mother, he got very sick, and my mother had to leave Albany and come to Perth and went to PMH. And in those days, uh, she was there as a young 25-year-old woman with this sick baby. And every, di every day she asked the, the uh, doctors and nurses, um, how is he doing? And she was told, we're keeping him comfortable, which of course was medical speak for there's nothing we can do. 
And that was something that a 25-year-old woman at the time didn't actually understand. And so she was uh, shocked and devastated uh, when her baby died only a few weeks later, and my, my youngest brother. But I think that was CF in the 1960s. And I'm only telling that story because today is a very different life for people with cystic fibrosis. Because now there's real hope. It's an exciting time to be alive with cystic fibrosis. So in the 60s, things started to change. Uh, we had pancreatic enzymes. Now those pills that were shown on the, the screen before, people with cystic fibrosis take them. And if Cohen can show his insulin pump, I can show my insulin pen. And my Creon, which helps to digest the food that I take. Uh, in those days, they didn't have these wonderful capsules that you could just take it two or three of with a meal. They had this stuff that was made up with, with a powder. And, uh, and I can tell you that the roses at St. Joseph's Convent in Albany didn't like it. In the 60s, we had uh, some, oh, in the 70s, there was some IV antibiotics and there was a thing called missense. And they thought that because people with cystic fibrosis couldn't digest the food that they had, that they should give them a low-fat diet because otherwise it, none of the food was being digested. Unfortunately, that led to people with CF having poor nutrition and poor growth. And I think that's one of the things I talked about at the beginning where there's been some steps forward and a few steps back because we still didn't know what was actually the cause of cystic fibrosis. By then we knew it was genetic, but really nobody quite knew how it worked. But then along came new capsules, so that, that meant you only had to take about 50 or 60 tablets a day rather than this horrible powder. And in the 70s, the late 70s, we started to learn that, oh, maybe if we gave people enzymes, we gave them a really high fat diet, they'd actually start to have grow properly, you'd have good nutrition. And we also started to use intravenous antibiotics and that was a really big change because it meant that you treated, people were getting sick with chest infections, treat them early, treat them aggressively, and suddenly there was a massive change. And, and the life of a person with cystic fibrosis not only was longer, but you were in much better health. Unfortunately, sadly, WA and Perth weren't at the leading edge of CF care in the 1970s, and there were no CF clinics, and people were, who were born with CF were assigned to whichever doctor was rostered on at the day. And many people perhaps missed out on that aggressive emerging aggressive treatment that was reaping the benefits around the world. I know that a young teenage boy named Stephen Messer did miss out on that and unfortunately when he was uh, <coughs> 14 uh, could no longer live with the, uh, the devastating effects of cystic fibrosis and uh, it is uh, 37 years ago this year unfortunately since he died this, this month. But thankfully that was changing and in Perth there was a doctor named Des Gurry who set up a de facto CF clinic around the time that Cystic Fibrosis WA was born. And, against, and that was born against the wishes of the local medical establishment of the time because they didn't want people comparing their treatments. They didn't want them asking questions. Again, it's a long, a long time has passed since then and things are different. But thankfully, through the brave group of parents who helped set that organisation up, we've actually been able to make sure that there are, the CF community has a voice and the CF community goes and asks and talks to people and tells people about the condition and tells them why we need support. And that's where groups like Cystic Fibrosis WA and its relationship with the health department has been fundamental because they're able to speak out and that's one of the things that uh, has been a really powerful thing. And groups like Conquer CF helping in that dream by holding this event is fantastic as well. <coughs> the 1980s came along, see I'm just doing a tour through the last few years. Uh, the 1980s came along and we, we had some great strides in CF. Suddenly they worked out that there were some problems with the, the cell function and that, uh, and that <coughs> that the chloride, the salt in your cells, couldn't go through the cell walls. And one of the people who discovered that was a guy named Paul Quinton. And now I happen to know Paul. Paul is almost 70, and he diagnosed, he's a scientist, and he diagnosed himself with CF and started pulling out sweat. He's um, doing experiments on his, t his own sweat gland. So I guess we could, um, Paul Quinton was the equivalent of a scientist who decided to test for how... Uh, 
ulcers occurred and that they were occurred by bacteria. Well, Paul was using his own sweat glands to work out how CF works. But there were some great discoveries. Early in the decade, we worked out where in the chromosomes of people um, the CF gene was. And then in 1989, there was fantastic excitement because the gene that causes cystic fibrosis was caused, was discovered. And that was the beginning of some major great new advances. We had the beginnings of re um, registry for patients as well, so we could track how we were doing. We could see, if you live in Perth, how, how is it that you do if, as compared to if you live in Brisbane or even if you live in New York? We had newborn screening in Australia before many others, and in fact, Australia was the first country in the world to screen all newborns for cystic fibrosis, and I think that's an absolutely fantastic achievement. <laughs> and it was, it was an achievement that was achieved through partnership between the CF community and the people who were treating people with CF. So it was the health professionals and people with CF and their families working together, and I think that's why CF is now doing so much better, because we work together in teamwork. In WA, in the 80s, there was the start of um, the, the children's uh, clinic at, Sis at Princess Margaret was getting up and running, and now that is one of the best centres in the world and is world-renowned for its care of CF. And that's all happened in the last 30 years. And there was also uh, a young consultant who went to Sir Charles Gardner Hospital. Now, when he arrived at Sir Charles Gardner, I think he had eight people who were, the over who were adults. There were eight adults with cystic fibrosis living in Western Australia in the early 1980s. That clinic today has over 150 people, and I think that speaks for itself about where we've come. <laughs> Unfortunately, we haven't had the wonderful um, end to CF through gene therapy that perhaps people were thinking. In 1989, we found the gene, we'll just treat, we'll um, be able to replace that gene and everything will be okay. But I think with genetics, we're finding the more we know, the more we don't know. However, what that has done is lead us down the path to where our understanding of what's happening is different. And Richard said at the beginning in his speech this evening that a drug named Kaleidico is now listed on the PBS. And there's a whole range of new drugs that are coming along to treat cystic fibrosis. And these are the first drugs ever to treat the underlying cause. So you can imagine the people with cystic fibrosis who were born today, who are going to live well into their adult lives and live quite healthy lives, and that was using treatments that were optimised um, to treat the symptoms of the disease. Just imagine what we're going to do in the future as we treat the disease itself. We don't have CF, we don't have um, gene therapy, as I said, but we're going to have things that are called correctors, which will actually fix the, the, uh, the cells. We're going to have potentiators so that all sorts of people with CF can get care. Kaleidico works for a specific type of CF with a mutation that's a specific type. There are now trials ongoing that are about to be completed and drugs going for registration that will be for everybody with CF. Those drugs will help make a difference, but they won't cure CF and they won't mean that our vision of lives unaffected by CF it has actually been achieved. Because with anything, there are always people that drugs don't necessarily work for. And what we really need to be doing is holding out and working on and redoubling our efforts to make sure that we can find out how to make those drugs work for everyone and not just a few. And I'm really pleased to be able to say, as a trustee of the Australian Research Trust, that only last week, we're also, <coughs> we have, uh, we have awarded a grant for over $400,000 to a group to look at some of the infections that, that ca uh, cause lots of troubles in cystic fibrosis so that we can make sure that people's lungs stay healthy until those new treatments arrive. So I hope tonight <laughs> that you're able to dig deep, that you're able to go out and tell the world that people with cystic fibrosis need your help and enjoy yourselves, so thanks very much.